You're probably no stranger to the concept of data brokers. The topic is so popular that it's even gone mainstream, with John Oliver doing a segment about it and members of Congress calling for tighter regulation on the industry. On my own site, The New Oil recommends a few data deletion services and has done a few videos on the topic. But while this is an important aspect to your privacy, there's another type of public data we don't always think about. Removing your data from people's search websites is vital to protect yourself and your loved ones from doxing, harassment, and other threats. But what about the content you willingly put out there? It's strongly encouraged that you be careful what you post online, but we're all human. It's easy to forget about an old post or to make multiple posts to add up to reveal a lot more information than you meant to. And unfortunately, not every service makes it easy to just click a setting and have your old post go away automatically. In fact, most don't have any such feature at all. Recently, I had the privilege of sitting down with Dan Saltman, co-founder of Redact.dev. Yeah, my pleasure. Redact is on a mission to tackle this exact problem, to help you clean up your user-generated online presence. At the time of this video, Redact works with over 30 different services like Discord, Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, even email providers, Spotify, IMDB, Steam, and many other popular services to scrub your old posts, likes, reviews, images, and more automatically for you. And they're always trying to add new ones. You can even use it in an ongoing fashion to automatically purge content after a set period of time with your existing active accounts. Needless to say, if this is a service that we can trust, it has the potential to be a serious game changer and a powerful tool in your privacy toolbox. So I was intrigued to hear what Dan had to say about it. As always, in the interest of transparency, I wanted to be noted that I was not paid for this interview. Dan reached out to me via email, and we've never spoken before, but I was genuinely intrigued by the service. That said, after this interview, I did sign up for an affiliate link. But as always, I will provide a non-affiliate link in the description as well for those who aren't comfortable with affiliate links. You can find out more information about how I decide on and use affiliate links on both the New Oil website and my latest transparency report. With that out of the way, I'm going to turn it over to my interview with Dan Saltman to tell us about Redact.dev. So let's start from the top. Tell us a little bit about Redact.dev and what it does. What is the, the product? As I'm sure... Anyone who watches anything that you do knows at this point that every single YouTube video that you watch is inundated with ads for, you know, uh, remove yourself from data brokers. And that's why I use this, because hackers could be getting my information. And it's getting to be a very crowded space, that whole data broker remover stuff. And the thing that's really interesting is all of them are targeting a sect of information that is very different than what we do. So what all of those services do is they target things that you never created ever about yourself. Like I didn't go and create a whitepages.com profile for myself. Someone else, you know, some automated system did that when they saw my voter record or something along those lines. But really Redact in a nutshell came several years ago. And that was that, you know, I used to use Skype a lot way back in the day, as did everyone. It was the main IM that you, you know, used if you're over 30, essentially, for many, many years. And then, you know, slowly Discord came around and other options, and I didn't anymore. And I was like, you know, I want to, uh, I want to get rid of this. But, like, I have a lot of sensitive stuff on here, you know, because I, I was dealing with you know, funding for startups. I was dealing with sending usernames and passwords to people over Skype, as everyone does. And I was like, okay, so what can I do? And at the time, I was like, okay, well, I can delete my account, but apparently all it takes is someone to social engineer Skype support representative, and then they can get it re-enabled. And if they somehow get the password change with social engineering or anything along those lines, they can go in and they can read every message because all of your chat messages were stored in the cloud. And that's still the case. So right now, it's pretty crazy for any of your viewers. If you did use Skype back in the day, go log in and yeah. Every message you sent years ago is there. And it's like, what the, this is, this is not okay. And there's nothing that you can do about it. And I think it goes back to 2018, I want to, I want to say, I don't, I don't have the top of my head. So that's pretty, that's pretty wild that it had that case. So essentially the thought of what we want to do is with Redact, it's like, first off, how do we solve this problem? Right. I don't want to delete my Skype account. And that's still true because there might be a day when I need to use it. You know, maybe I need to communicate with someone and they's like, hey, I can only do Skype because I'm in, you know, some country that doesn't allow Discord or something. So I want to keep my account, but I want all these messages gone. And I think that's the case for a lot of services. People don't want to go and delete their stuff. They just want to delete their messages. And some make it difficult. Like on, on Discord, if you delete your account, all your messages stay. It's just it says your your account name is now deleted you know, deleted user, but that's very easy to put back together because all of our DMs are still there. On Twitter, if you delete your account, all your stuff is gone, but I really don't want to delete my account. I just want to delete my old tweets. So there's a wide spectrum of reasoning to, to do this. And, you know, essentially no one's created software that focuses on the data that we create willingly. Everyone's always focused on the stuff that like 
other people create about you, but we put way more stuff online than anyone else could put out about us. Uh, and we just forget about it and that's it. So yeah, that was kind of the, the building blocks for it. And then we kept expanding to more services and doing more things and everything else. So tell us a little bit about you in terms of this project. You, you kind of said why you decided to create it. What are your like quote unquote qualifications? And I say that loosely because like I personally, I have no formal training in like cybersecurity or anything. And I'm very upfront about that. But also, yeah, no, you know, I've, I've put in a lot of time researching it and stuff. So do you have any, any sort of background in this stuff or just a lot of... Yeah. So I've been doing technology startups for about 20 years at this point, and it's gravitated oh, wow. all across the board. You know, I built my own data center from the ground up, meaning oh, wow. we turned it from literally an uh, uh, empty warehouse into a three megawatt facility that hosted thousands of machines in there. I created the largest competitor, ironically, to Skype at the time around 2009, 2010. And that was a, a massive undertaking with hundreds of servers and millions of users and, and done venture funding. And I've done, you know, I've done a lot of um, startups in between uh, covering different aspects of life, everything from, you know, online petitions to security software for web servers. So it's really, I'm a lifelong entrepreneur and someone that's really focused on uh, creating usable products is what I would say. But it sounds like, just out of curiosity, it sounds like you also do have some under the hood knowledge about programming and networks and at least at least yeah. some preliminary. Yeah, I would cool. say I'm pretty good. So I try to act much more so as a product manager than as a engineer <laughs> at this company. But funny enough, if like you go look at our commits for the last like two weeks, I think I'm probably number one or number two on the sheer amount of commits. Not that they're like, you know, as substantive as uh, some of our other people, but you know, I'm going in there and I'm making changes where it need be and things like that, fixing errors and things along those lines. So I try to get in, get in the mix. Most of what I do, and I think probably the most important thing is, is getting involved with user support because it's kind of how you get to know your product better than anything else you can is when people are not happy and they want to <laughs> complain to you on Discord or over email, like you're on the front lines. You see immediately like, oh yeah, uh, I as a power user immediately understand that this button is pre-checked and why, but you as a first time user is completely confused. And I like would have never known that unless I went and I, I saw and talked to that user. So that it's good to get in there and do support as a, as a founder. You mentioned commits. Is is Redact open source? It's not open source. And that's oh, probably okay. a question that we get a lot. Not at this time. Full disclosure, I'm one of those people that I prefer open source, but I don't think it's always a bad thing. Like one password, for example, is not open source, but you know, a lot of experts really vouch for it and they've been audited and stuff like that. So personally, I'm I'm not a believer that everything has to be open source, but I was just curious because you mentioned commits. One of the things that I really believe is that no tool is perfect. I'm a strong believer that any tool that tries to do everything at best ends up doing everything half well, as opposed to tools that try to do solve one specific problem really well. So mm -hmm. what would you say that Redact, um, like what would you say are its strengths and what would you say are some weaknesses or some things that prospective users should know, like, hey, don't expect it to do this because that's not what it's designed to do. The biggest thing with Redact is our strengths are that we are a locally run application. That's something I'm pretty passionate about. And even, even early on, I think we lost some opportunities for much faster growth because of doing it along those lines. So every, let's just use data brokers as an example, mm -hmm. or sorry, data broker room workers as an example. All of these guys, they're not a program that you download. All of them are a website and you go there and you give them all your information. You know, here's my name, here's my full box, basically. And from that, then they take that information behind the scenes. And then they, you know, they, there's, I can talk a lot because we're going to be working on a product that uh, kind of competes in that space as well. But I didn't want to be like that. Like if, if Redact gets taken over tomorrow by North Korea or something along those lines, <laughs> we'll want traveling there. Um, the information that they have about our users is, you know, the, the payments of people that have upgraded and that's it because everything is on the computer itself or on the device itself. And we don't make use of a server. So there is no redact in the middle of your deletions. When you download the program, the deletions are happening directly between your computer and the end service. And that's the way it should be. Meaning we don't even, I don't even know the account of a single user that's on our platform. It's all completely anonymous and built that way. It's, it's like a web browser, right? Like you wouldn't expect Firefox, even though they have that level of access, you wouldn't expect them to know what sites that you visit or what your passwords are. It's a utility. And that's how I wanted to build what we did to be completely privacy centric and focused on the user. 
That's awesome. Of course, I did look around the website and do some research, but I actually didn't sign up or anything. So I didn't even know it was a program you download. That's that's really cool. We'll talk about that a little more in a second. When you were talking, you you mentioned about, I think you were talking about how basically if you log out, somebody could social engineer their way into, into their, your account. But sure. it kind of got me wondering, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'm just kind of asking, is there any... I guess a reasonable reason to believe that when we request that they delete stuff, that companies are actually deleting it. Like, do we have any way of knowing that discord isn't secretly logging our messages somewhere? uh, That's a great question. So there's always that risk. And I balance it on, on two things. You can never trust a company as far as you can throw them, but you can trust them (laughs) in their financial self-interest to not get sued for doing crazy stuff. I will say one, one unique thing that did come up recently is that I believe, if you remember, there was like the, the Discord leaks that happened between um, that, that army sergeant, right? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, uh, the reservist uh, who was leaking Ukrainian war secrets. Right. Yeah, I remember that. And something that was really interesting is apparently, I, I think this is the right case. It could be the wrong case, but let's just assume it is. And if not, I'll, I'll, I'll update it. But he had also other messages that he had deleted with someone else, private messages. And the FBI was like, hey, we need these. And Discord was like, well, once they're gone, we, that's it. We don't have them. So that's pretty Ooh. telling, I think, at that point. If you can look for examples of that happening, that's good. Now, I don't, there's always the capability of someone changing something in the future, right? But as far as for what's deleted, we at least have some litmus right now to show that, hey, the FBI wanted to get access to these deleted messages and Discord said they literally do not have them. There is no backup, there's nothing they can do. And I I think to a certain extent, sometimes that makes sense and is reasonable because if you think about the cost associated with storing those things permanently, it gets pretty crazy. Again, with these things, I always err on the side of, you know, is the company really going to be this crazy to potentially get access to this data, you know, and then and then pay for the storage for it and the additional servers and the live everything? Or is it just more likely when you delete it that they delete it and they just want something that doesn't take that work? So that's how we look. And of course, it, it's always better to delete it and hope that that's the case than to not delete it and just know it's not the case. So there's no question in my mind. I would always try and delete it. That's a good point. I just want to point out because I know someone's going to say it in the comments of like storage is really, really cheap. True. But we're, we're comparing like the NSA, for example, who has, you know, burning duck dump trucks of government money that they don't have to answer for versus a company like Discord who has to explain why we've got 10 servers sitting around storing messages from 10 years ago. Well, so. yeah, it's also, and again, look, look at Discord. I believe recently, didn't they just leave the, uh, they let go 30% of their workforce. Like you think right. like, Hey, Maybe we should, instead of letting go of all these employees that are like making us grow, maybe, you know, why don't we just turn off those secret, you know, backup servers that, and it's not just storage, by the way, it's, you know, their live tail, you have to be able to query the data. There's a whole lot of stuff. So I don't want to get into the technical stuff. I certainly think it's possible, but I think in most cases, we can assume that when we delete data, that even though it is possible that it could be in some, you know, overarching huge database, like, you know, but you know, I think those cases are rare. Like the days, I, I think a lot of us think about services like social social networking services, like a website. Like, hey, I, I made a backup of my database. That way, if it crashes, I can restore it and have my website back. It, it does not like work that way uh, to a certain extent with these large social networks. The ability of doing that would be uh, unfathomably expensive and difficult and everything. So it's much more, it's, it's very different. So, but there you go. No, that ma- makes a lot of sense. And I also like your statement about like, well, sure, if you delete it, they might not delete it, but if you don't delete it, you know for sure they're not gonna delete it. So it makes exactly. sense. I, I'm in the same boat. Just one more thing I wanted to comment on that. You mentioned how like looking at court cases and stuff. I personally do that with like VPNs and stuff. Like if you look up, uh, not that I'd necessarily recommend them, but like, um, I think it's private internet access, PIA they have court cases where they've been subpoenaed for data and they're like, we don't have anything to turn over. Like signal is the same way. And, and oh. you know, there's always people out there that are like, Oh, they're lying. But personally, I think it's like, nah, man, if they get caught lying to the government for a subpoena, the consequences are going to be so much worse than if they just turned it over. So, yeah, I, I think there is one different part of this. And I think this is probably the important part. And, and I've, I've said stuff to this for proton mail and things like that. I feel like, Oh, it's secure. You know, the code's open source. You can see everything. They don't have access to it. I, I verified it myself. All of this stuff is true, meaning that the the stuff in the past, perhaps the government can't get, but depending on the, the government and where you're at, what's to stop the FBI for banging on the door of Microsoft saying, hey, hey, Microsoft, listen, you like all the billion dollar contracts you have? You are literally going to push out a fake Windows update 
to this IP address. And if you don't, you know, I don't know, we're putting all your people in jail and, th and that's the end, right? And it, it doesn't matter. And the same thing, you know, we take like a, a proton mail, for instance, like, hey, proton mail, I don't know, you know, maybe not, it's not possible with the Swiss government or something, but whatever, right. hey, proton mail, for this user, you're going to change this JS file that's hosted on the website to be this one. And you're going to do it and you're going to shut up. And, you know, you're not allowed to challenge this or you're going to jail. And then, you know, that all, basically it's the XKCD, you know, your stuff is only as secure as the government wants to. Like, you may not have historical stuff, but if they want to, they can always force you to change your code moving forward. Uh, you can try and fight it, but, you know, at least in the, in the United States, there's been stuff where you're not even allowed to disclose that it's happening in the first mm -hmm. place. So it, it's not that simple. There is nothing that is secure whatsoever if they really care about it. And that's just the end of the situation is. So all you can really rely on is how much information do you have about the situation, the people involved? Do they care about privacy? Are they dealing fake promises? And that's one of the things I hate. There's a lot of companies that say, no matter what, we can't get your data. Like I know, again, Proton Mail is I'm doing, no matter what, there's no way, it's not possible. And I'm like, dude, I could get everyone's data on Proton Mail in five seconds. Let me upload a JavaScript file to the to the web view and that's it. <laughs> and I'll just read everything and report back. But but like, oh no, no, no. You know, it, it so that that's the type of stuff you have to be reasonable with what you do and what you don't. And that's it. Sure. Yeah. On that note, so why would you say, you've kind of already touched on this a little bit by mentioning that the program runs locally. Why would you say that users can trust you with their data? Because, you know, you download this program, you log into it, and, you know, presumably now it's got my Reddit login, my Discord login, my Skype login. Well, I mean, really, you're just banking on the fact of, you know, me and the team that we're on here who have dumped, you know, millions of dollars into the product of our own money, essentially, at this point. You're banking on the fact that, I don't want to throw away that company so that I, uh, basically, I don't want to go to jail, first of all. And then <laughs> second of all, the data that you have is not going to be worth it for me to, um, to do it. It's a good enough product on its own that there's no reason to be shady and to be sneaky and, and anything else along those lines. And, you know, I, you know, my name is out there as being involved in this company and I value my name. I value what we're doing, but it's the reason we did the download. Otherwise it would have been a lot simpler if we just did this thing as a web, meaning you just go to redact.dev and you type all your information on your user account and we do everything behind the scenes. You don't even need to download anything because that means the conversions are much easier for the user. I don't need, it's kind of difficult to get people to download software, you know, in this day and age when they want to do something, you know, like look at like Tweetly or, you know, any of these other services, they don't make you download anything. They just, they, you know, you go there, you owe off your app and they do everything. And it's like, you know, we could have done the same but I think that's shit. I, I'm trying not to be in the middle of your data. So the fact that I could do it that way and choose not to, I hope gives some purpose to the fact that this is the proper way to do things, even though it affects our bottom line and the amount of users we can get to, to go and do it. Just a quick note before I, I found out that the program is downloadable, I assumed you guys do OAuth. And a couple months ago, I, I was able to sit in on a talk where somebody in, in great, great technical detail, most of which went over my head, explained how OAuth works and why it's pretty safe to use. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of figured, I'm like, oh, he'll explain what OAuth is. And yeah, but again, like like you said, it all runs locally. I'm like, wow, that's really amazing. So OAuth, yeah, it, it, OAuth is an absolutely better way to do this type of stuff. But for some things, so for Twitter, it is an option to do this on the web. I mean, there's reasons to not do it, but then you take services where maybe OAuth isn't an option. There's no OAuth for Skype to delete your messages. There's no OAuth for Discord or Facebook to, still to this day, Facebook does not have an OAuth access point to let you delete messages. Uh, and that's wow. not that's not incidental. So it is right. certainly possible for some services, like it's probably possible for Twitter, it's probably possible for Reddit, but you get better access and better speeds when it's coming directly from your device. Because think about it, if there was a server in the way, like let's say all of your you know deletion requests are coming from redact.dev server of you know x.x.x for the IP address, that means everyone's coming from that IP, Twitter or Reddit might start throttling it. But now because it's just your computer doing it, it's just your computer talking directly to Twitter, it's kind of, it's much faster. There's less in between. There's no possibility of anything. So yeah, that's the, the benefit of that. And you don't have to have us being able to even know your Twitter account, right? So tweet delete or any of these other, you know, services that work like that, they know your Twitter account, they know your tweets, they know what they're deleting, they know what's in them. 
you know, they can say, oh, but we delete it right away. We don't even have to say that because we don't have access in the first place. I didn't even think about that, about the uh, rate limiting and it all coming from a, you know, a data center. And yeah, that's mm -hmm. a really good point. So again, this is another one you've, you've kind of answered, but um, you know, when you first contacted me, of course, like I said, responsible person, I did, did a little bit of a research and I see, like you mentioned, you've done a lot of startups and stuff. And so are there any mechanisms in place to ensure that users can continue to trust Redact even after, if you someday move on, sell the company or just take a position somewhere else, whatever it may be, is there anything in place to make sure that user data will be protected in that event? Well, like, again, in the spirit of being like completely not selling bullshit, I feel like any other startup founder would be up here and be like, oh yeah, for sure. There's like, you know, the guiding principles of everything. And it's like, the, the truth is uh, I could tell you that it would destroy the company to do anything else, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter because there's no legally binding way. It's just my word of, of how I want this to go. I can say that I've already been very successful with the stuff I've done in the past. And that this is what I want to do. This isn't like I have to make this work to survive or anything. This is, I believe that by creating the overarching best, biggest privacy company that does nothing except focus on privacy and done the right way from ground one, that that is something that I want to do for the rest of my life. So the idea of selling it, it you know, sure, is it possible that like one of these massive companies can be like, hey, Dan, have a billion dollars. That's a thought to have uh, <laughs> about that coming case. I do not think that's likely to happen. A lot of the, you know, all the big people that would buy a company like this, for the most part, don't really like what you do. You know, they, they want to keep <laughs> right. the data, they want you to delete it. But yeah, that, that said, listen, I, I use the product myself. I don't want to see it go to shit. So that's the best metric I can give to you for it. Anyone that says anything else of, you know, anything else is just is full of it, basically. You have to be realistic with, with where it's at. But I will say 100%, okay, well, 99%, because I guess I could get, <laughs> like, tied up with a wrench or something. But if anything was ever to change, there would be a huge amount of notice, and people would have full ability to exit the platform before anything happened. So that's 99% because there is the chance that, like, as I said, the FBI comes in here, ties me up, starts hitting me with something and makes me right. start physically typing on my keychain. So there you go. The uh, proverbial, you mentioned XKCD, the proverbial rubber hose attack. Which uh, Exactly. But yeah. aside from that happening, first off, I have no plans and I don't think we ever will go that direction. But if we somehow had to, we would give plenty of notice to users of that so that no one past or present would be affected by anything. Yeah, I just want to stress to viewers, I'm a firm believer that who knows what the future holds. I appreciate you mentioning, like, at this time, there's no plans. Might change someday, but right now there's no plans. And I, I think I agree with you. That's kind of the best guarantee we we can really have these days about anything is like, I have no plans right now, but who knows what will change in 5, 10, 20 years. So. Yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff can get mixed up, but I think we're on a pretty solid trajectory of where we're building this product. We're very excited about what we're doing. You know, and, and again... When we started Redact, there, like the options were for deleting your stuff. First off, the, every option that there was was very service segmented, meaning you could maybe go delete your Discord messages or you could maybe go delete your Facebook messages with one service. But it was always like, here, here are like the options that you had. Option one, okay, first you need to get a USB drive and I need you to format it to FAT32. Once you do that, go ahead and download Kali Linux, and then I need you to get uh, get this repo and then change this config file. And it's like, dude, my grandmother is not going to do this to go and delete some Skype messages. So that was the first part of, of kind of very advanced open source scripts that, like, you know, just were not simple. The second thing was very sketchy and shady Chrome and Firefox extensions where you really didn't know what was going on. It was like, hey, do I want to go and install the delete all posts from every service extension from some weird name I've, I can't pronounce at all that has four stars and 15 users. And it's like, I don't know. It's asking for full access to my browser and all my history. So there was that part. And then the other one was just the very service specific ones, again, like the twit, Twitter deleters and things along those lines, which cost more than we do, only do one thing and they get in the way between you and your data. So the real premise of, of making Redact was one software suite that handles everything for deleting all of your data across, you know, 40 different services and does it privately and securely. And you don't have to pay extra to do everything. Once you've paid, that's it. One of the big things, you know, and we can talk about that later is the data broker stuff. But uh, yeah, for right now, social chat, work and productivity, that's all stuff that our bread and butter, basically. 
Well, I was actually, um, I was kind of coming up to the end of my question. So if you wanted to say something specific about data brokers and your thoughts on that, feel free. I did think of one more question. Well, this might actually tie into that. I think I meant to write this one down and I forgot to, but I was just curious, is there anything, I know it says on the website that if anybody has any suggestions for services they'd like to see to, to contact you guys. But aside from that, is there anything on the, the radar that you guys are planning, like a service you're planning to add that's not currently listed or any sort of features or anything like that? That you're oh, uh, comfortable talking about, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have Instagram and Teams that are in Facebook Messenger are both, they've been incredibly difficult and complicated and convoluted. And both of those things are going to be that. coming back and returning. They've been down for months and months at this point. So there's that. But the, the big overarching thing that we're launching coming up here is our data broker removal solution. And I want to stress just how horrible it is how everyone else works in this space are you familiar at all with how all these other services work you know because there's there's like four or five of them i'm loosely familiar so i know if i understand correctly basically you sign up you give them the information you want them to remove like name email address phone number which on that note there's i've, I've done a couple videos about this but there's some websites that only do like your email address and it's like that's not very useful but from what i understand it's mostly an automated script thing yeah, and there's not so, really a lot of oversight of if they even took the data down or not. Yep. Yeah, so how how most of these things work? It's it's two things. So you give them your full docs, everything. So that's like your name, your address, your phone number, all the places you've lived, your family members. You're trying to give all this to them, and then the idea is that what they're going to do is they're going to take that data and they're going to search on you know, and there's like hundreds of these like whitepages.com style websites that are out there that lets you go and you know browse people, I guess, you know, so when you search a phone number, someone comes up. And of course, what they do is they say, hey, we're going to remove you from these things. And the big problem behind all of that is the way that everything works. So first of all, a lot of these guys, you think, oh, it's technological, like, you know, this, you know, they're obviously doing behind the scenes scripts. A lot of this stuff, it's done just by people in the Philippines or in Malaysia, whatever. Mm. They're giving your information that you sign up to them. And they're just handing it over for some of these difficult sites to underpaid workers in third world countries who are manually going and doing these opt-out forms on these sites. And it is disgusting behavior. I did not, not know only that. because of, of your just continuing to support an industry that keeps wages low down there. But secondly, if someone's that desperate that they're working for like five or ten dollars a day, you know, your data is worth a bit of information here. Is there any oversight on that? Like, you know, how do you know you're not getting copied? So there's that as a front. The second thing as well is of course now all of these requests are coming in between their servers and the data brokers themselves. That's another thing. Additionally, the way that they do the deletions a lot of the time isn't even the right way. So you, for a lot of these websites, you can pull your stuff down right away if you do it by yourself. Like for instance, let's say your stuff is on whatever, you know, personpages.com or something along those lines. Typically there's gonna be a link at the bottom of the site that says opt out. You go there and you put in your profile URL you s submit your email address and they do a confirmation email and then it's instantly removed as soon as you do that. Mm -hmm. So why is it when I use these services that none of them <laughs> instantly remove your stuff? And the answer is simple. It's because none of them do that. None of them automatically go and do it to that front. I mean, there might be some that they do, but for all of them, absolutely not. For many of them, what they're doing is they're relying on emails. They're just going in, in cold talk, spamming out emails to these services like, hey, John Smith from Oklahoma, remove him. And they're like, hey, sir, you can please, you can use this form. And they say, no, this is enough. And it's like this huge process where they're doing it as opposed to just going and automated uh, and using the form. And the reasoning behind that, of course, is the forms have CAPTCHAs. They have email submits behind them. Meaning like if I go and I click delete myself, I have to type in a CAPTCHA and then I have to go and, and click an email in my inbox. But because of the way Redact works, we can do that. The CAPTCHA stuff we can usually solve. And then the email click, we already have email as an integration built into Redact. Redact supports email as well for deletion. So we can check your inbox for the incoming email and then automatically click the link and delete it. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why it's better to do these data broker deletions directly on your device versus trusting another person. Because by the way, what's going to happen when one of these data brokers gets hacked eventually or something happens in the data? That's a whole lot of very privacy oriented people that are now going to have their full docs exposed to the world. And you know, again, they might say, oh, no, it's triple encrypted and everything else. Well, you know, that doesn't stop some of the password managers from getting hacked. So, again, the idea is that by using us, that can't happen. Literally, your information stays on your device. 
those services because they make use of people in third world countries and their own IPs and everything to do it. You can only run it once a month, maybe once every 45 days. Ours is on your computer. You can run it every day, every, every hour if you want to check. If there's <laughs> new but add your, your parents, add your neighbors. It doesn't matter because it's all coming directly from your computer. There, it, we've taken the server out of the equation. So that's the big thing that we're launching. That's going to be coming up here in the first quarter. And that's going to be basically the same type of usability experience that we've brought with Redact so far. So I guess, you know, before I leave, I'll just say, remember that anyone who's going through your old tweets or your old Discord messages or, your, or any of this stuff, like from a year ago, they're not doing it out of, out of a good reason. They're doing it usually to harm you. And it, there's danger. It's not just like the typical stuff. Oh, I'm going to get canceled because I said a bad word four years ago. That's the minor stuff. The mm -hmm. more automated stuff now is what happens when these bots are able to comb through all of your tweets over the last 10 years. And now they can go and they can call your mom in an automated fashion and know all these details through AI and literally be like, hey, mom. God, you remember last year when I was in the Bahamas and I lost my snorkels? Dude, it happened again, and I lost my wallet this time. Can you send me money? How are you going to defend against that when that amount of information is out is out there, right? It's just what, what's standing in between that? And the only answer is removing the data before these people are able to get access to it. And again, to your thing of, oh, it might still be out there. Yeah, but I'd at least like to make them really try to work very hard to get it versus to make it right there. So... Yeah, that's kind of the, the litmus of, of where we're at, the, the one-click privacy button for everything. 100%. Just in case anyone didn't know what you were talking about, about people finding those tweets and contacting your loved ones, that's already a thing. And I don't know if it's always that complex, but there's I think they call it virtual kidnapping, where somebody will uh, you know call a parent and be like, hey, we have your daughter or your son. And mm -hmm. sometimes they'll even find a, a clip of that person from like a video on Facebook or something to try and convince you that they do. And it's like, you need to send us money. And it's, you know, when you're emotional and you're scared, you're not thinking clearly. The scary part of it, so privacy also really ties heavily into security. And right. the reason that that's the case is that we know the, the people that, that make use of technology faster than anyone else in the world, there's two companies, porn companies and <laughs> bad actor, like mm -hmm. malware companies. They're at it at the forefront. So if you're telling someone, that they can automatically go and just download and, and scan all of my tweets over 10 years or all of my Facebook posts or my Instagram posts or whatever. And then they can go and they can build this, this model of who I am and use that to do damage that it's incredibly powerful. And it's not like they have there, you have to be specifically targeted for this to happen. That's a big thing. People probably thinking like, Oh yeah, whatever. No one's ever going to target me. This is happening automated now. It's just, it's like, you know how you get spam calls? That spam call wasn't targeting like, oh, let's go after Bob Smith. I think he has $15. It's just going down one by one by one by one down the list after they building models of you. So it's absolutely a real thing. I implore people either through us or through someone else to go and completely do a clean sweep, delete, go delete everything older than 30 days if you, if you care about it. Your old stuff doesn't do you any good. It's only going to hurt you. You know, if you really care that much, download a backup and then keep that. But aside from that, it's not worth it, man. Get rid of it. That's what you do, my parting words. I want to thank Dan again for taking the time to appear on my channel. As you probably picked up in the interview, I was extremely impressed by Dan's answers and I learned a lot. Since the interview, I've actually signed up for Redact to help purge old new oil posts on Blue Sky, and I'll probably find some other uses for it too. With the new oil newsfeed especially, it's really important to me that I don't let old posts linger for too long because in the tech space, and the privacy space especially, information can very quickly get outdated. Services shut down, get sold, get abandoned, or become compromised, and it's important to me that people don't accidentally stumble on those old posts in a search engine or something like that and think that it's still accurate information. Redact is a tool that I hope will be helpful in keeping us accurate like that. Like I said at the beginning though, it's mainly useful for individuals. It's targeted at you watching this video. You absolutely can delete all your old posts manually and periodically, but that's cumbersome and you might forget or you might put it off for too long. Redact is admittedly a little bit pricey, relatively speaking, but personally it seems to me that they're offering something nobody else in the space currently is. And for those comfortable with affiliate links, you can get 15% off using mine, but again, no pressure. They also offer a limited free tier that has unlimited content deletion for Twitter and Reddit, which are two popular social media services in the privacy space. So for some people, that might be more than enough for you, or if you're on the fence, it may serve as a good trial. 
I want to point out that as with every other tool in the privacy space, Redact may not be something that everyone needs or even wants, and that's okay. But for those who are curious, I do recommend at least perusing the website for some more information. Thanks again for watching. Thanks again to Dan for his time, and I will see you guys in the next video.